Nintendo used a custom version of the popular 6502 CPU for the Famicom and the Nintendo Entertainment System. And there's quite a bit of controversy around whether or not they were licensed to use this chip by Commodore. Stick around and join me as we explore this topic and take a look at how this chip works. Welcome to episode two of my series called Inside the Famicom. It's well known that the CPU inside the Famicom and the NES is a 6502 which was originally designed by a company called Moss Technology and later acquired by Commodore in 1976. But if you pop the hood on a Famicom, the chip that you'll find on the main board is not a Moss branded chip. Instead, you'll find a custom chip made by the Japanese electronics company Rico. According to Brian Bagnall's book, Commodore the Amiga years, Rico was licensed to produce the 6502 in Japan. If you're in a country where the NTSC standard is used, this chip will have the model number 2A03. But if you're in a country that uses the PAL standard, your chip will be a 2A07. Functionally, both chips are the same, but there are a couple of differences which I'll talk about more as we move along. The chips made by Ricoh aren't simply a rebranding of the 6502. Instead, you can think of them as an ASIC, or an application-specific integrated circuit. In other words, it's a custom implementation that's been modified. If you were to peer inside one of these chips, you would certainly find a 6502-compatible CPU, but you would also find an additional chip alongside it which Nintendo calls the APU, or Audio Processing Unit. The APU is dedicated to producing sound, and it does this by using five different audio channels. I'll have a video later in this series dedicated to audio, so we'll put a pin in this topic for now and come back to it later. But the 6502 CPU inside of this Rico chip is almost identical to the MOS 6502 chip. The key word here being almost. The MOS 6502 has built-in support for working with numbers using an encoding scheme called Binary Coded Decimal, or BCD. BCD is a method for encoding numerical data in a way that makes it easier to work with the individual digits. For example, here I have a single byte of binary data, which represents the decimal number 93. If I wanted to work with each digit individually in my code, I would need to take that decimal number and perform additional calculations on it to isolate the digits. These additional calculations could be demanding for an 8-bit CPU. But BCD treats the data differently. Instead, a byte is split into two different 4-bit numbers, and each 4 bits represents a single digit. So the number 93 in BCD would instead look like this and this makes working with single digits much easier. In 1976, Moss patented a BCD adder circuit that they built into the 6502. Any developer using a 6502 could put it into BCD mode by setting a special flag, and Nintendo would surely want to leverage BCD in their games. It would make the process of displaying numbers such as scores, lives, and levels much easier. But this BCD feature is missing from Ricoh's implementation of the 6502. When die photographs of the 2A03 were analyzed, it was found that the circuitry for the BCD functionality was indeed there. But five of the necessary transistors were removed, rendering the BCD capability unusable. So this begs the question. Did Nintendo remove the BCD feature to avoid having to pay Commodore royalties for using its patented technology? What do you think? Leave a comment and let me know. Over the years, the design of the 2A03 didn't really change much, but it did get a few revisions. If you have an original Famicom with the square buttons, then your chip will be an RP2A03 with no other letter codes after it. 
but later models of the Famicom, as well as the NES, had different revisions of this chip, and they all had minor differences and bug fixes. These chips weren't just used in Nintendo's consoles, however, you'll also find the two A03 in some Nintendo arcade machines as well. The clone market for these chips was also quite active. There's even a page in the NES dev wiki that's dedicated to documenting the various clone chips and their differences from the originals. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about how the 6502 CPU works. At its core, the main job of any CPU is to execute instructions, and the 6502 is no exception. It does this by reading an instruction from a memory address, executing that instruction, and then moving on to the next one. The 6502 has 56 different instructions that can be given to it. These instructions can tell the CPU to do a variety of things, such as moving data around in memory, performing arithmetic operations, or changing data that's held in the CPU's internal memory. These bits of internal memory are called registers, and they're a very important part of how a CPU works. You can think of a register as a chunk of high-speed temporary memory that lives inside the CPU itself. The 6502 has six different registers. First, there's the accumulator. This is an 8-bit register that's commonly used for arithmetic. There's also two other 8-bit registers called X and Y. These are referred to as index registers because certain instructions will use them for storing memory offsets. In addition to these, there are three other special registers called the program counter, the status register, and the stack pointer. The program counter is a 16-bit register that contains the memory address of the next instruction that needs to be executed. The status register is 8 bits long, and each bit represents a different status flag for the CPU. And the stack pointer is also an 8-bit register, and it contains the location of the stack. The stack is just a chunk of contiguous memory for temporary storage. This gives the CPU the ability to temporarily set the data in its registers aside. For example, if the CPU needs to use the accumulator for an instruction, it can push its current data onto the stack. And then later, it can restore it by pulling that data back off the stack. To keep track of where in the stack to push and pull data, the memory address of the next empty stack element is kept in the stack pointer register. When the CPU pushes data onto the stack, the stack pointer is decremented by one. And when the CPU pulls that data back off the stack, the stack pointer is incremented by one. Let's see how all of this works by looking at an example. This snippet of code is from Super Mario Brothers. When you collect a coin in the game, this is the code that increments the player's coin count. Notice that this code starts at memory address BC0C, so that's what the program counter is set to. The number of coins for the player is held in memory at the address 075E. The program counter is pointing at the INC instruction, so that's the first instruction that gets executed in our example. INC will increment the value at memory address 075E by 1. Since the two bytes following the increment instruction were address data, the program counter skips over those locations and now points to the address of the next instruction at BC0F. Next, the LDA instruction copies the value at 075E into the accumulator. Then CMP compares it to the hexadecimal value 64 which is the decimal number 100. The game does this because if the player gets 100 coins, it needs to give Mario an extra life and roll the coin counter around back to zero. And so this next instruction is a branch if not equal to memory address BC22. In other words, if the player doesn't have 100 coins, then the game will skip over the code that gives the player an extra life. Okay, with this high-level understanding of how the 6502 works, we can now take a look at a few other aspects of this chip.
The Famicom's processor has 40 pins. It operates on 5 volts, so there's 5 volts of power going into pin 40. And pin 20 is connected to ground. The 6502 CPU uses a memory mapped architecture, so it interfaces with other chips and devices by using a set of address pins and a set of data pins. We're going to cover this topic in more depth in the next episode, so I'm not going to go any further into how that piece works right now. Pin 3 is for the reset signal, and it's active low. That means that it's normally at a logic high. If you want to reset the chip, you would pull down pin 3 to ground. Here I have pin 3 connected to my oscilloscope. When I press the reset button on the Famicom, you'll see that the signal goes low, and then when reset is released, the CPU will start executing code that's referenced at its reset vector. The reset vector is a special memory address whose data is the memory address of the code that should run when the CPU is reset. For a 6502 CPU such as the one in the Famicom, the reset vector lives at addresses FFFC and FFFD. You'll recall from earlier that the program counter register inside the CPU holds the address of the next instruction to be executed. When the CPU is reset, the value in memory at the reset vector is copied into the program counter. Then when the program begins code execution, it runs the instructions at this address. The reset function isn't the only aspect of the CPU that uses this technique. Alongside the reset vector, you'll also find two interrupt vectors. An interrupt is an event that instructs the CPU to pause what it's doing and instead run an interrupt routine. There are two different types of interrupts, and they're triggered by putting a low signal on either pin 32 or pin 33. If an interrupt is triggered on pin 32, it's considered an interrupt request or an IRQ. The CPU will pause what it's doing and run the code that's pointed to by the IRQ vector, which is FFFE and FFFF. A similar process happens if an interrupt is triggered on pin 33, but pin 33 is considered a non-maskable interrupt, also known as an NMI. The main difference between the two is that you can tell the CPU to ignore an IRQ by setting a special processor flag. But an NMI can never be ignored. They're considered critical system functions that the CPU has to prioritize. When a non-maskable interrupt occurs, the CPU uses the memory address stored at FFFA and FFFB to set the program counter to the NMI routine. We'll revisit this topic in a later video when we talk about how the Famicom does graphics. The process of reading the interrupt vectors is similar to the way the CPU reads the reset vector. It populates the program counter with the memory address of the interrupt routine. But this process does differ in one way. Before reading the interrupt vector, the CPU saves the program counter's current value to the stack so that it can return back to that location to continue executing instructions after the interrupt is finished. Going back to our chip, pin 29 is the input signal for the clock. The oscillator that produces this master clock signal is located here on the Famicom mainboard. And for Japanese Famicoms and North American NESs, it produces a 21.47727 MHz clock. For European NESs, the master clock is actually faster at 26.60171 MHz. The real CPU speed, however, is not the same as the master clock. Once the clock signal enters the CPU, the processor divides it by 12 if you're in Japan or North America, or it divides it by 16 if you're in Europe. And that produces a CPU clock speed of around 1.79 MHz for NTSC devices and 1.66 MHz for PAL devices. Pin 31 is an output clock signal that's based on that internally divided CPU clock. Here I have my oscilloscope connected to pin 31, and as you can see, 
The clock signal coming out of it is around 1.79 MHz. Pins 35 through 39 are used for the controllers, and pins 1 and 2 are audio output pins. I'm going to cover the controllers and audio in separate videos, so we'll revisit those aspects of this chip later on. And that leaves us with two pins, pin 34 and pin 30. Pin 34 is a read and write pin, which we'll talk about in the next video. But pin 30 is a little bit odd. This pin is normally tied to ground, but it's been shown that for some of the 2A03 revisions, pulling this pin high will activate some additional diagnostic audio registers. In other revisions, pulling this pin high will either do nothing or just stall the CPU. Overall, Nintendo's use of the 6502 was well suited for this generation of their consoles. Despite some of the controversy surrounding their use of this chip, they still successfully pulled off using it for many years. Even though we looked at some of the operational characteristics of Ricoh's chips in this video, there's still a major piece that we need to dive into. So in the next episode, we're going to take a look at the memory mapped architecture, and I'm going to show you how the CPU talks to the other chips and devices in the Famicom. All right, I think that about wraps it up for this episode. I'll see you next time. But until then, go make something cool.